So tonight, we are going to talk about branding because at this point in our world, developing a brand that is long lasting through the ups and downs and a brand that can make it through the tiny little attention span that we all have, it really takes work. And we invited this man because he is not only a great hairdresser, He's also a mentor and educator. He's an entrepreneur. He's a salon owner. So he's been in the trenches with you all, but he is doing a fantastic job of building his own presence and his own brand. So please welcome Mr. Rob Fuchs. What's Hello. up, Rob? How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you, Andrew? Life is good, my friend. So happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. For sure. So one thing I did not mention is, too, I think you're going to be quite surprised with this person, <laughs> this man's experience at this point, because you just told me that you just barely turned 30. I actually am turning 30 in July. Yep. Oh, you're turning 30 in July. So, I mean, to me, especially at 42, I think of like 30 as like a teenager at this point. But man, like you have done so much already within your within your career. I mean, you're a salon owner. You've been a busy hairdresser. Now you're starting to actually, and you're actually creating physical product now too, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what, what are you creating? So right now I am, I've actually just got finished creating my first, um, silk elixir so basically what it is it's like the the perfect blend between a oil and a serum so it's for smoothness and shine and all that but of course i have my own um edge control so it's like an edge pomade to tame your hair and everything so yep yeah, awesome very cool and what what is the brand under just your name or what what's the product under yeah so the um the product is rob books um hair care collection so yes sir yep so cool. Yeah. So let's uh, let's dig into branding. Why why are you so passionate about this this concept of building a brand? So I became passionate about building a brand years ago. Um, I, I was fortunate enough. I'm the third generation um, hairstylist in my family and third generation hair um, salon owner in my family. And so oh. I was privileged enough um, to worked in my aunt's salon as I was actively in beauty supply. I mean, beauty salon, like school. So I had the privilege of doing that. So I was basically getting like on the job training the entire time. Um, but the thing that motivated me the most to um, pursue and have a passion for branding was like working with my aunt. Um, she was the most popular hairstylist in our hometown. Like everybody came to her. Um, nice. The salon was like consistently booked. Like people were, it was, it was like a revolving, revolving door. People were in and out of there all day long. And I remember, um, I'll never forget, one day I had came to the salon, straight to the salon from school. And I told her I was just looking through a magazine and I just so happened to come across like a hair product campaign in the magazine. And I was like, hey, I think you should really consider uh, launching your own hair product. I'm like, you know, everybody already comes to you. They know you. They trust you. Why not? And um, at the time, she wasn't prepared. She wasn't ready to take on that responsibility, which I understand because it is a significant responsibility. But um, that was the one thing that sparked. And so ever since then, I was looking for a way to find out how could I like do the same? Like, how? OK, I'm giving you this advice. So as I'm building and as I'm growing, I just, you know, develop the skill to scale up. Um, so, of course, I took a lot of time to develop my skill and to develop my craft and specializing in hair extensions, natural mm -hmm. hair care, all of that. Um, but above all of that, I, I knew that when the time came for me to stop doing hair and to no longer be behind the chair, I knew that because I love the industry so much, I want to always be a part and have my hands in the industry. So I had to think like, what way could I do that? And of course, having and establishing a brand um, that is associated with a product line is a way. And of course, I was able to do that with the help of some amazing people. In particular, one person I see in the comments, Marquetta Breslin, gave me some great insight throughout the years. She's my mentor, guys. So she gave me some amazing insight on how to achieve all that I'm doing today. So yes. Very cool. 
Yep. Yeah, I love that you um, you were the one that was bringing that to the attention of your aunt yep. coming in and saying like, as is still, so you were still in school at this point, you're yep. coming in and saying, hey, you should start this product line. Yep. So at what point in your career did, did you start to uh, develop that first product? I knew that I wanted to evolve. So it, it hasn't been that many years. Of course, like I said, um, a lot of what I'm doing now, it was introduced to me, even though I had the idea and the concept behind it, um, more of it was introduced once I met my mentor. And so, um, of course, she saw something in me that only myself and God knew clearly. Yeah. Um, and she helped pull that out of me. So I basically, what I saw in my aunt was the same experience that I ended up living. Um, not only did I get burnt out, you know, I started getting burnt out working behind the chair, but I was fully booked graduating high school. People don't really know this about me, but um, only the people that are close to me, I actually did not want to do hair. No kidding. It's crazy, right? I didn't even want to do hair. I wanted to go to school. I had my mind made up in high school. I did go to beauty school because I wanted to do something. Um, but I actually wanted to graduate high school and go to college in New York and, and study fashion at the Arts Institute. And no one knows right that. On. I, yes, I wanted to actually be a wardrobe stylist. Okay. It's crazy, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I ended up, uh, you know, just settling for hair. I was making, I was graduating high school in the 12th grade, 12th grade, and I literally was making over $1,000 a week doing hair. And I was just like, uh, college or- It's hard to pass up, especially at that age, right? It's so hard to pass up. So yeah. I had to, I just, you know, I took, you know, what I thought was best in that time in my life, and I decided to pursue hair and continue making the money that I was making. So yes. Yeah, nice. That's beautiful. And, you know, so, Again, like, I mean, you don't, you haven't been in the industry that long when you, when we're looking at it from the perspective of these 30, 40 year old veterans, of course, but you started to notice pretty quickly that there's a lifespan. That's right. Which I think is something important and something we often talk to students about, which is, you know, there's only a handful of you that will be able to even have the stamina. That's right. Even if you wanted to, to be behind the chair full time, 30, 40 years into your career. Mm -hmm. So that kind of tells us, like you're saying, that it's important to start to look ahead. Mm -hmm. So um, as you start to look at building a brand for yourself, what, is, what are some of the things that people should look at as they start to think about building a brand for the future? Well, I want to talk on the lifespan part first, if you don't mind. Um, Please, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I always keep in the back of my head, of course, I had the experience and I had the the tenure in the salon. Um, and I know that everybody is not, they're not, you know, able to be a salon owner. It's everybody does, it doesn't fit in that role. And I understand that. But um, one of the things just maybe years ago, I can't even remember how, how many years ago, but Years ago, I was on social media and a viral video of a like 70 plus year old woman had came across my newsfeed. I don't, I can't remember if someone tagged me in it or not, but it had came across my newsfeed of it, like a 70 year old woman still in the salon behind the chair doing hair. And it was the most beautiful thing in the world to see. But at the same time, I was like, count me out <laughs> count me out I, good for you yes. i will celebrate that you still want to be there but that's not me <laughs> yes i was like count me out i will not be 70 plus still doing hair so um there is a, a span and i feel like you have to know that um in advance you have to know that ahead of time it's not something that you know you get to the end and you realize oh i have to start developing a product or oh because there's a process you know there's a process to yeah. people knowing you there's a part and as marquetta has taught me for years there's a process of two people knowing you liking you and trusting you so you can't wait until you're at the end of your game to start trying to develop something and expect people to you know trust you enough to buy it so yeah and just pause there for one second because i think that that's such a key piece of tonight is that you can't wait until you're already burned out yeah. to start this process. Like if you, uh, if you look ahead and you see, okay, yeah, like I want five more years behind the chair or six or 10 or whatever it is, you know, now's the time to start building what you're telling us, which is to start building a relationship with the community. Right. So that when it is time to say, Oh, Hey, you know what? I've got this product. 
um, Sam always has this thing that within the Sam via company, he always reminds us and he's like, people buy people first, then they buy things. Definitely. And I think that that's so true. Like if they don't trust you, if they don't have that relationship with you, they kind of don't care what you have or how special the bottle is. Mm -hmm. It's what's behind that bottle, right? That's absolutely correct. And honestly, there's a common misconception that, and this is, I feel like this is one of the main things that hold people up, is that you feel like you have to be perfect and everything has to be perfect. And the reason why I feel like that's uh, erroneous is because there is also a process, as well, as well as you getting people to know you, like you, and trust you, there's also a process of learning um, mm -hmm. that includes failure, that includes uh getting it right, getting it wrong, you know, and doing that in a cycle for a while before you actually have a, a perfect pr um, production. So it's definitely a common misconception that, oh, I have to wait, I have to wait. No, you don't have to wait because in the waiting, you can actually be trying to figure it out and getting it perfected. Yeah. And so looking back, looking back at your career so far, what might have you have done different in the early days? Ooh, a lot. knowing that this was this was the trajectory for your future a lot um <laughs> i don't even know where to start with that but the number one thing i probably would have saved a lot more money <laughs> because, okay great tip because that's one of the things that also holds people back is knowing that there's something that i tent something tangible outside of what my hands can do that i do need to produce and leave in the in the earth but there's always in the back of their head, well, I don't really have the money. I don't have the means right. I need the resources to fulfill that. And so um, people know credit and cash is king. <laughs> it's, yeah. And so if I could take anything back or, or relive anything, that would be the number one experience because you have to make a lot of sacrifices um, and you have to be extremely disciplined. So that's that's something for sure that I would definitely reconsider. Yeah. And let's let's show Rob some love here. Who else out there with just a me in the chat? Who else looks back at the beginning of their career and says, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have spent every paycheck and maybe I should have built up some savings and not maxed out my credit cards. For sure. All of us. <laughs> me and yes. yes. Yeah. And lots of love coming in in the chat. Um, Tara said you, her plan is similar to yours, Rob's. She wants to create her own brand. So in the future, she has the option to work. Doesn't have to be behind the chair. And I love this comment from only you can be you. College is overrated, especially when one is naturally gifted and talented. And it's yes. true, you know, like, I think that that's the message so often to our, our, you know, younger generation is that college is that logical next step. But I mean, of course, we can't wave a magic wand and know where Rob folks would be right now had you gone to college and went to, you know, into fashion. But I imagine you're pretty happy with where life has taken you at this point. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy, yes. And I'm sure there's a lot of beautiful women out there that are happy as well. <laughs> <laughs> I to go to school for fashion, yes. Absolutely. So what else do you feel like you um, have done so far to build? And especially we kind of talked about that legacy brand, something that can last. Like what, what makes up a legacy brand? Okay, so to me, when I think of legacy, and I know people are like, you're only 30 years old and you're talking about legacy. I believe in it so much. Like literally, uh, I get talked about in my circle because all I watch is documentaries. And, you know, <laughs> those are, that's just my thing. Like, I love it because I, I'm so inspired by the stories of, you know, the Cornelius Vanderbilt and, you know, the, uh, the Carnegie's, you know, all of them. Yeah. I'm so inspired by their stories. And another thing is um, back then they didn't have as much as we have. They don't have they didn't have all of the technology. So they were building legacy. They didn't know they were building legacy. But now we have the the you know the privilege to build legacy and actually know you're building legacy because of the things that you are building along with it. Um, but to answer your question, the first thing that I did um, in my business to bring the legacy piece together was diversify. Um, mm. I knew I couldn't do hair forever. My hands couldn't do hair. My feet couldn't stand and do hair forever. Uh, so I started selling hair extensions. Um, yeah. I 
actually specialize in the salon. I specialize in hair extensions and wigs. And so for the longest time, my clients were purchasing hair from, you know, just random places. And I would get so irritated and frustrated by uh, the, the bad hair that, you know, I was having to do. And at one point I was just like, okay, I need to just go ahead and start, you know, my own and, and start developing my own. So I developed my own uh hair extension product line and now you know people are able to go on my website and purchase hair extensions at any time 24 7 literally all year long um yeah. all they have to do is tap on a couple of buttons on their phone and they can cash out and purchase hair and that actually is probably one of the number one things that is sustaining um in the midst of a pandemic uh like right in the beginning last year when we got locked down of course i know the salon was closed um and we weren't able to do much in the salon yeah. and i was able to still you know run a business and make money running a business and actually it's crazy because um through that system of knowing liking and trusting i was able to amplify uh, my other businesses, and I was able to make more money actually than what I am making on a normal basis in the salon. So it was it was crazy. Nice. It was crazy how that how that worked out. Cool. So we have to diversify. We have to have that kind of um, wide footprint, <laughs> so that kind of like you're saying, if one thing gets taken out, it doesn't just deflate the whole system, right? Yep. So what else what else helps to create a brand that has that staying power and legacy to it? You definitely have to know your message. You have to know your message and uh, you have to know your why. And honestly, people go a long time searching for that. Uh, but essentially, our why is honestly the same. If we really consider it, our, everyone's why is to help make life easier for someone else. Walmart was built to help make life easier for civilians. So everyone has the same, you know, why really, it may be a different avenue. We may get to that, that point of our why or our purpose in a different way, but essentially we all have the same why and it's to make life easier and to leave someone else better off than we were or better off than they were before they met us. Yeah. So I believe that's number one, definitely knowing your message um, to build your brand and actually knowing your why, knowing why you have to do this, knowing who your target market is, knowing who your audience is and learning how to speak the language of that person throughout your entire relationship with them. Right. So how do you how do you start that process? Because that sounds simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm me speaking from experience, <laughs> you know, taking this big wide world of like, yeah, I know I want to help people and I want to support people, but you can't just, that's too big, right? Yeah. Like we have to refine it to something where we can actually start to say, hey, yes, you're my customer because I have a solution that's specifically for you. So how do, how do you start to refine that from such a big picture down to something that you can then create a brand from? Uh, I'll say this, and I'm, I'm, I can say this because this is a conversation that I've had um, several times with uh, stylists that work under me, um, people that I've mentored in the past that, ha that are sometimes trapped in a mindset of what do I do that no one else does? Or, or basically, how can people trust me more than they trust that? You there's a level of confidence that you have to have that mm -hmm. no matter whether someone that's sitting right next to me does the same thing that I do or not. I know that there are a people that are called to me by God. There are people that are called to me that yeah. only I can relate to and that can only relate to me. And they, their ears are, are actually, were actually created to be inclined to my voice. And so cool. that's something that, that's something that people have to know within building is that because and the reason why this is important to know is because if you don't know that and establish that mentally first before you're going into building your brand and your business, you'll literally get into a rat race of trying to compete with people when really you should just be sitting back and chilling. Like you should be chilling because those people are going to come. Like no matter who does what you do, the people are going to come. So start there. Start being confident and knowing that there's something that I have that only I can give and that there are people there's a sphere of influence that only I can touch. Hmm. I got chills when you said that 
their ears are specifically formed to hear your message. Because yeah. that, honestly, Rob, how are you only 29 years old? Uh, it, I mean, still to this day, that's the message that I personally can honestly say I have a hard time just getting through my thick skull yes. is that there's there's this group and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how many hamburgers are out there right like right. don't open a McDonald's next to a McDonald's of course but could you open a different burger joint next to a McDonald's right yes because there's going to be that group of people that want your hamburger and hate McDonald's hamburgers because you made it specifically for them. Yeah. And so there's always that audience, even if it's a small audience, right. which I'm starting to also feel, Rob, and you tell me what you think about this. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel like the small audience is kind of the way to go at this point. It's the sweet spot. It really is. Yeah. And you have to know it. And once you know it, you have to kill it, like kill it there. Like they're wait they've been waiting for you for years. So you just have to believe that and know that. And when you get into your space, you have to be so confident enough to just kill it. Just like how you can literally put a McDonald's next to a Burger King and people are going to always still choose McDonald's. It is what it is. We're serving the same thing. But yeah. I, have my, I have my flavor that only my people will like. And you have your flavor that your people will like. So yeah. So do the same thing. So kind of, again, like, how do you find that though? Like, how do you, how do you narrow that down to like, okay, this is, this is my burger that no one else makes, but mm -hmm. I make it so special and people are wanting to find my burger. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I think that I have learned throughout the years is most of the time, the thing that irritates and agitates you the most is what you need to fine tune and hone in on. Okay. And once you do that and people see you doing that, that's when they naturally just gravitate. Hmm. Okay. So what was the, what was the thing that irritated and agitated you? Cause I'm getting a sense this was part of your experience. <laughs> yes. Oftentimes it is in many different uh, forms, not even just in hair, but in many different forms of my life where I know that I'm called to lead. Um, Things irritate me so much to the point where I know, you know, it's basically a sign from God telling me, okay, you have to be that change. So, yeah, yeah. you have to be that change. Yeah. And I love that Kia is popping in here because this kind of sounds similar to the conversation we had, which is sometimes it has to hit you that hard. It has to be that thing that irritates you so bad. Or, you know, she was talking about her bout with COVID. And yeah. sometimes it has to kind of hit that point so that we listen to the message mm -hmm. that was probably in our in our in our ear the whole time okay. but something had to happen that was a hard enough hit that it goes okay i'm paying attention now and i'm going to tell you i'll say since you know we're all in the beauty industry i'll use i'll use the salon my salon work uh yeah. so many times that you know people would come to my chair and they're like i just spent uh i'll give you a prime example um and i ended i ended up working at my aunt's salon. And as I was working at my aunt's salon, um, this woman had brought her biracial daughter into the salon. And she had just left the, another salon and literally paid $400 for the services that her daughter had just received. And it looked like her hair was completely untouched, like oh. she had just rolled out of the bed. So things like that, it just shows you even the more, okay, this is what I'm called to change. Like, there's no reason why $400 should have just left her wallet for that, but we're going to fix it today. That's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And so when you were starting to look at what you would create within your, your um, legacy brand, mm -hmm. <laughs> what kind of things did you look at when you started to say, okay, well, what kind of products or what kind of services or what kind of, whatever am I going to offer the world? Well, I particularly specialize in African-American hair. Um, of course, that's not limited to anyone, um, but I know what they need. Um, I know that, and I've worked, you know, in various different salons and I know what type of products black women need for their hair. And um, 
nine times out of 10, when I'm styling a client's hair in, a, in the salon, they're asking me, oh, what are you using? Or what is this? Or what is that? And you're constantly using products and you're paying for products that you do not get any credit for. That's why I literally drill and so many people said, this is something that I learned from Marquetta, affiliates. If you can become an affiliate of this product, become that. Because if you're going to tell your clients about the products, then there's, there should be some sort of credit uh, that you receive from you know referring that product. So those are the things, That's those are part of the uh, reasons how and why I started developing my own product line because people wanted to know what I was using. And a lot of times I was name dropping, you know, so many different, you know, companies. So that's part of the reason. And I knew that, you know, these things were needed for women at home every single day. Gotcha. So you saw a need within the, the group of people that you have the closest connection to you look, okay, here's my audience that I have the deepest connection with. Here's a need that needs fulfilled within that audience. So I'm going to create the solution for that problem. Just like everyone says, pick the lowest hanging fruit. <laughs> pick the lowest hanging fruit. You know, you can be broad. And I'm going to say that because um, I could sell shampoo. And a lot of people don't understand this or don't know this, but I could sell shampoo to a black woman all day long for her hair. But nine times out of 10, they're not going to use it at home because they don't need to do their hair at home, you know? So you have to know what your client needs. You have to know how you can provide and how you can uh, establish a product line for your target demographic or whoever your client is. So, yes. Right. And, you know, one of the things too, Rob, that like, I think is interesting is that, so you started with, you said it was a pomade that you started with? Okay, let's be honest. How many hundreds of pomades are on store shelves? So I mean, many. So, so many. Yeah, so, so many. So when I think about, because you mentioned this earlier, you almost mentioned like people get caught up with well, what can I make that no one else makes? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, okay, well, why, why a pomade? Because that's... Like there's millions of them. Why, why make a pomade as your first product? Mm -hmm. um, I'll say this. Uh, it was a need, like it was a direct need. It was something that I was using in the salon every day. And everyone was always asking like, what is this? So that's how, and like, they literally were begging me for it. <laughs> like it's almost I, too apparent. Yeah. As I was testing the product, they were like, when is it coming out? So I'm like, Oh, you guys really want this product. So I have to deliver. So you'll know your, your, your clients will let you know. And even if your clients don't let you know, and you know that there's something that you're really passionate about or that you like the most go with it. It doesn't have to be any, I don't feel like um, you may have, you have much more experience in this than me, but I just don't feel like from my experience that it has to go any specific order. Yeah. And to, to your point, and I, I knew Marquetta was watching, I kind of almost asked that specifically because I know she's watching and I know that she's kind of the, the big proponent of don't miss the thing that's sitting right in front of you just because you think everyone else has one. Exactly. Well, who cares? They don't have yours. Mm -hmm. And just like you said in the very beginning of our conversation, they want yours because they love you. They don't want this stuff from the grocery store because it doesn't come from you. And listen, Andrew, I say that all the time. Your name matters more than anything that you'll ever do. Literally, your name matters more. There, there are reasons why... <laughs> Versace and other different brands. I don't know if I can name, but there are so many brands out here that they literally create some of the weirdest looking things. But <laughs> people, like, who knew that we were going to be wearing sock sneakers? Like, where did that theory come from? Right. You know, but these people knew that our name matters more. It doesn't matter. We can literally put paper bags, you know, on someone's ponytail and because our name matters more, people are going to buy it. They're going to buy it because they trust us and they like us. So, yeah. So let let's go in that direction. How how do you build that name that people really care about and people really connect to? I think the main thing to do is to be be honest. 
be integral mm-hmm. and be consistent. Those three things will take you further than you could ever imagine. Be honest, be consistent, and be integral. Mm-hmm. Those, like, do not rate people for um, what you feel like you need to get from them. Mm-hmm. Be integral. Love that. Yeah. That's so beautifully simple. So yeah. <clears throat> why do people get so caught up then in this sort of social media game? Like, okay, how do I just like kind of use and abuse the followers to try and get a bigger following, get a bigger response? Because I, I feel like we're there's kind of something out there teaching people to do that. Yes, there is actually, Andrew. And, in, and that's honestly in more sectors in the world than social media and the beauty industry. Honestly, um, one of my biggest pet peeves is um, forgetting about the people that rocked with you when you were nobody. And Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times people are looking for fame and they don't even realize that the thing, first of all, fame is nothing that, you know, you, it just happens. No one, no one pursues fame, obviously it happens naturally, but it happens by and through the course of you being consistent with the ones who have been consistent with you yeah. the most. So yeah, I, I think that that is vital. And I think that's important in the world of social media, um, not being so caught up on the perception in the mind of, oh, I got to get more followers. I got to gain more. Pe-. No, feed and nurture the people that you have right now and mm. the rest will follow. So how do you do that within your brand? Like, what are the things you do to kind of show your integrity and show that honesty through your brand? I'm honest. Like, I I basically am, for the most part, an open book. So mm-hmm. when I fail, people know I fail. When it's not right, I will make sure that you know it's not right. So just being being a real human being. Um, I, one of the, the main things that I learned from um, being mentored by Marquetta is that she, people want to know that you are a human being behind your brand. Uh, right. They want to know that there's a human back there that they can relate to. They see the name. They see the name. They see the beautiful logos. They see all of the nice filtered pictures and everything beautiful. But at the end of the day, they really want to know that there's a person there that they can relate to. So just be relatable. Like I think that's one of um, my greatest strengths is being relatable and being honest with people. And, you know, just be down to earth. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with commenting back to people and like, and you know, that's something that we get caught up into as well in the world of social media, but I understand. Yeah. <laughs> right. So is there a point that's almost too um, authentic? Um, I don't think you can ever be too authentic. I don't think you, anyone should be reckless, um, but I don't like, you know, I, I personally, um, when I'm coaching people and, you know, telling them, you know, we're going into the social media aspect of their business and their brand. I, I help them to understand like you cannot, uh, people won't take your business and your brand serious if they can see you. And I know this is the world that we're living in today and it works for some people. But uh, if they see you out on the weekends partying and posting all of your personal, you know, endeavors in life <laughs> on social media. And then on Monday, you're you're trying to come and bring them into a world of the professional. It just doesn't work. Some, like I said, it does work for some people. And we are actually in an era now, it's, it's kind of weird because we're in an era now where that kind of stuff actually does get more um, engagement. But honestly, Andrew, if I can be honest with you, it may get more engagement now, but it's it's never going to be sustainable because those those things don't last forever. OK, so that's a great distinction, I think, because the whole point here is talking about how do you build this legacy brand? And part of that is not getting caught up in the moment of yes. what's happening. Right. Because I think that it's easy to get caught up in, well, this is what's popular on social right now. Like, again, I, I heard Mar- Marquetta and Ricky talking about this the other night that, you know, Instagram and Facebook's great, but who's to say they're not going to just shut that down next week? Absolutely. Like, who's to say that that's not going to become the old platform? Yeah. So, um, like, not getting caught up in this moment of what is cool or this moment of what is working mm-hmm. so that you can have that legacy to it. That's right. I just feel like it's so important not to live impulsive. There are some times in business where you will have to take risk. 
um, and you'll have to make sacrifices, but I don't think that's the same as being impulsive. And I feel like a lot of people are impulsive and in about 30 years, they'll look back on those uh, impulsive things and they'll realize that it was completely stupid and they shouldn't, <laughs> and they shouldn't have, so yes. So just because you said it, I don't know why, but it just popped into my mind, but I wanted to ask you, what are some of the risks that you took that worked for you? And were there a few that you're like, Oh, crap. Okay, that didn't work. Well, the number one risk is actually following what you believe in. Uh, that's mm. the, the biggest risk. Because honestly, at the end of the day, uh, my wife was actually just uh, reading a post on social media earlier, and it said something about uh, everyone doesn't know your call because it's not a conference call. I was like, it took me a minute. <laughs> really, I'm not going to lie. Hands of God. Like, it took me a minute to get it, but after she read it again, I was like, wait, say that again? It was so good, everyone doesn't know. And so when you think about it, it's you and God here. Like you know what it is that you've been, you know, called to do and what you're supposed to do. And so that alone requires so much faith and risk taking because no one else is gonna believe it if you don't believe it. So you have to definitely believe that first. You have to believe that you're called to do exactly what you say you're supposed to do and move forward in that. Yeah. Yeah. So were there any in risks that you took that didn't go so well? Um, let's see. Well, I'll say this. Uh, the risk of launching my first product and not having enough inventory, that did not go well at all because okay. <laughs> I had one mind of thinking that, you know, I only needed a certain amount, but then it literally oversold and I wasn't prepared. So that was, I took that risk, but I guess I didn't take it large enough. So right now that's the only thing I could think of, but I didn't take it large enough. And so, yeah, I was had a whole lot of orders on standby and back order because we were just sold out of everything. Guess is the go big or go home quote, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So I want to ask you something that's a little on the personal side. And if you don't want to talk about it, that's totally fine. But sure. one of the things that... I think we were always told is to not show your spiritual belief system inside of your business. Yeah. I noticed that you are quite open about spirituality and like your connection to God. So just, just talk to me a bit about your perspective on that. Okay. Um, first thing is I personally, and I'll, I'll tell anybody this, I don't care if it's the president of the United States, I'll tell him, I have history with God. And um, there are certain things in life that you could literally only get through um, unless you have you know, someone bigger than yourself to help you through it. And I, and I always believe that God is the only one that has been able to help me get through the things in life that I have had to go through, the, the experiences, the hurt, the trauma, the pain, um, all of that, I couldn't have done on my own. So God will always get the glory out of my life, always. Nice. Yeah. And so how do you, how do you feel about that, that kind of mindset of like, don't show that because, you know, because maybe someone isn't a Christian or they, they don't have the same beliefs as you. Yeah, most definitely. So, you know, and, and kind of even thinking just back to the early days of hair, they would specifically say like, oh, don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics, don't talk about this, don't talk about this, mm -hmm. like anything that could be controversial or someone, something that people feel passionate about that they might not agree with you on. Right. But I feel like that's changing. So it is. People are more liberal nowadays, honestly. And and I will say this, um, we just got finished talking about being authentic. So yes. I would just say that, like, be your authentic self, be yourself, whatever you feel like gives you strength every day to get out of the bed and do whatever it is that you have to do. That is what you believe in. And you should never be ashamed of that. And you should always be proud, um, whether you're Christian or not. You know, I have amazing friends that are not Christian and they don't believe in the same God that I believe in, but I love them like mm -hmm. they do. So. And I, I think that that's the key. Like yes. you, because I watch your feed and I watch like how you speak and like the things that you say and you never put that stuff out there in a way that's like, well, this is right. You're wrong. Like there's no shame or blame or anything like that with it. Like you can tell that it's this um, very genuine, very authentic, open hearted thing that you're sharing about yourself that it doesn't feel 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't feel like if I'm not a Christian, I'm not welcome, right? Like I don't ever get that impression from you. Right. Um, no, not at all. And and I honestly have to say the people that force anything on, on others obviously are the main people that are living in a crisis. Um, you, you, you just can't force anything on anybody, no belief, nothing that you do, nothing that you believe in. You can't force that on anyone. So um, you just have to love everyone the same, no matter whether they believe in what you believe or not. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. Love that. Love that. So as far as let's say I'm just someone that I'm just right at that beginning stage of, I need to start creating my, my brand and I need to start relating to a community. What are some of the first little bite sized steps that people can take to start creating that community? Talk about what you're passionate about. I'll say this. Um, when I, earlier when I was talking about, you know, making the, the money in the midst of the pandemic, one of the things that I feel like propelled me to that was the fact that I nur was nurturing in the midst of nurturing my audience. And I was basically giving them the information that they need. And in turn, people, people, when people trust you, it's just something different. When people trust you, you, they can, you can pretty much get whatever, you know, from the, and same vice versa. You guys, you, you basically grow into a relationship and, and they trust you. And the fact that they trust you, you begin to trust them. So just nurturing that audience and, and speaking about whatever it is. I know we talk about passion a lot, whatever you're passionate about, but honestly, it, it really is whatever you're passionate about, whatever makes you the most happy, um, that's what it is that you are supposed to to talk start begin talking about and honestly while you're talking about it you always have to be mindful of when you're ready to pivot because at mm -hmm. the end of the day you have to always always be fulfilled there would never be a such thing as kindergarten to 12th grade if we were not called or created to evolve and to pivot and to to grow into a greater uh, version of ourselves. So I think that that's another thing. A lot of us in the beauty industry, we get stuck because we are, um, we become kind of enslaved to the mindset that, oh, I have to just stay behind the chair when really you may, you may just very well be evolving and not know that, you know, you're mm -hmm. evolving. Yeah. I love how you put that. You may be evolving, but you don't even know it. <laughs> yeah. Because you get stuck. I mean, you really do get stuck. And and after a while, that stuckness becomes bitterness if you're not careful enough to know what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. So what, where do you feel like the, it's best to start those conversations? Is it just social media or... Um, well, really, if you're in the, in the beauty industry, I think you should start in your in your chair. Like, if mm -hmm. as, you're, as you're talking to your clients, make sure that you're giving them um, the wherewithal to do what they need to do to keep the keep up their hair, um, to take care of their hair at home. Not just selling them product. Of course, we we know how to do that very well, and we're successful at it. But a lot of us have to also become successful at actually educating. I I don't believe in the mindset of Oh, if I tell you too much, you're not going to be a, be a consumer anymore. No, I right. feel like if I tell you too much or if I give you enough information, yes. you're going to trust me for the rest of your life. Um, just like I had a, a talk with Marquetta and Ricky on their show, and um, I was talking about the art of wigs. Um, and of course, I could make more money doing extensions. I could always make more money doing extensions because that's a service that my clients will consistently come back for. But I know that if I make you one wig, it's going to last you for at least a year without without proper maintenance to three to four years with the best. Wow. maintenance. So you could really get more for your money if you're with someone that actually cares about what you're spending and cares about investing into you. So it starts in your chair. To answer your question, it starts in your chair. And then, yes, I would say scale to social media and continue your conversation. YouTube is popping. So if you can handle YouTube, it's a lot of work. Um, but if you can handle YouTube, it's amazing. Yeah. So I love, 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 love what you just said, because I think sometimes when we start to think about community, because we've been so... Um, so focused on this digital community, yeah. you forget that we have that community already built right there in the chair. 
honest, mm -hmm. it really is. And I and and not only in the chair, but I tell one of my friends, she's amazing. She's an amazing creative director, and she's an amazing creative director. But she hates social media, and I always, mm. I always, now I do force some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> So I always try to force her into getting more active um, on social media because her mind is amazing. And what I tell her often is, do you know that our grandparents had to pay for billboards to go on outside? Like we literally don't even have to pay for billboards anymore. Our social media is a humongous billboard for us that we literally can utilize to our our best potential without even having to spend a dime. You know, now of course we have the, the paid ads and things, but you don't have to, as long as you're consistent and you have an audience, you can speak whatever message you need to relay. Okay. So Rob, talk to us old fogies here for a second. Talk to us old grumpy folks that don't want to spend our time on Instagram. We I don't want to spend our time on Facebook. We know we have to, mm -hmm. how, how do we, how do we get things done? and not feel like we're glued to this thing. Okay, so what I think is the best practice to start with, and the more you um, perfect this, the more I feel like you'll be you'll be more eager because you'll eventually get the engagement that you're looking for, um, is be, be start, first of all, figure out what consistency looks like to you. Um, okay. Consistency to me is every day, at least mm -hmm. um, nurturing my audience every day, I have to. Um, Mark would have drilled that into me, by the way. <laughs> but um, I've been always taught to nurture my audience as much as I possibly can. So it, the, you have to just think about what you want. If you want more, you have to give more. Um, but first, figure out what nurturing and, and what consistency looks like to you and establish that and do that. If you say, I'm only going to get on social media on Mondays and, and on Saturdays when I'm most free, do that and just continue with it as long as you can until you get the engagement that you want and then grow into that. You know, you can scale little by little into that. Yeah. Beautiful. So how do you, how do you have enough content for a daily post? Oh, <laughs> now that's a great question because sometimes I ask myself, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, because my brand is, so becoming so vast, um, Andrew, um, it's almost like be right before my eyes, it's shifting from just a hair brand to um, an education brand, a lifestyle brand. So many parts of my, my business is evolving um, right now. And so I have to sometimes sit back and say, okay, we need to plan it out and figure out what we're going to do and what we're going to talk about, what we're going to discuss. Um, and so that's, that's what helps me is just sitting still sometimes and just figuring out what we're going to do. And um repurpose it like take some old stuff and hmm. throw it back up if you need to if you're if you're ever stuck and you don't know what you need to post i love uh throwback thursdays and flashback fridays i mean they're lifesavers for me yeah <laughs> so yes definitely use it to your fullest um ability that was one thing that even creating content over the years for our youtube channel for sam via that was always really hard for me because I always had this mindset, well, we kind of taught that before, like, should we shoot another video like that? But then I I think that our, our social media team shared with me one time that the actual percentage of your audience that sees that post, yep. it was tiny. It was like two or three percent or something. Yeah. Was minuscule. So they're like, as far as repeating content, the okay. probability that that same group of people saw that content is probably pretty low. <laughs> yeah, I was actually going to say I couldn't tell that you guys were <laughs> because I was a frequent watcher and I always enjoyed everything. But um, one thing I will say is you have to consider the people also that come in new that have never saw what you or seen, or seen what you have posted. So you know it's a help for for them as well. And you never know, you know. Something just may touch someone that day. Um, you may have posted this quote, you know, three months ago, but today it matters more. And if you're led to post it, post it. You never know. Yeah, beautiful. Rob, any uh, any other last tips you have for our audience today to really build that legacy brand or to to build a brand that really shines? I do. Um, the one thing I want to leave with everyone is um, you can't I always say this. 
I, I have to remind myself of this. Um, it's not that you're rushing to a place. It's not that you are, um, you know, trying to get there faster than you should be. But one thing to always remember is that you cannot wait until you are in need of a thing to develop that thing. Um, because you you for, you then forsake the process of fine tuning it and and perfecting it along the way. So don't wait. Um, I know that you know COVID has a lot of have given us a lot of restrictions. So it gives us a lot more time to focus on the things that we actually need to focus on now so that we are not so controlled by what we can do and can't do in our industry. Um, E-commerce is blowing up. So if you've ever wanted to do anything with e-commerce, now is the time, you know, now is the time. Beautiful. Man, this hour was filled with gems. I knew you were going to knock it out of the park. I didn't wow. know you were going to knock it out of the park this far. This, oh, wow. I, mean, I, I hope you've seen the comments as they've come in. But if you didn't, you can go back to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel and see the comments because people have gotten so much from you today, Rob. Wow. You truly are. Um, your wisdom's way beyond your years, my friend. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you for having me so much. Yeah, everyone sh show them some love in the comments, in the chat. Rob, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram, or oh, also Twitter. I am trying my best to become a, a Twitter person. Okay. <laughs> so you can follow me on all those platforms at Rob Fuchs. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much. I'm going to pop you off here. Wait in the green room for me so I can say goodbye to you before you take off. But thank you so much from all of us here at Sambia. This was such a blessing. Thank you so much. I appreciate it again. Thank you. For sure.